and welcome everyone, welcome ladies and gentlemen to SCI. This used to be my home for, for uh, about five months until I left the, the Stockholm office for the uh, office in Oxford, which is equally nice but very different. Uh, but it feels very, very good, it feels a bit like a homecoming for me to, to, to be back uh, here at the Institute. Um, so to start, to start off with, uh, Jakob already introduced uh, the background of, of the report that we're launching today and, and the, the project that we've done. Uh, but I wanted to give a little bit of detail and I also wanted to express some of uh, the thanks that, that Jakob already mentioned, uh, mainly to the, the, the Nordic Council uh, working group of climate change, the global climate negotiators. Um, and we have uh, pretty much the whole uh, working group uh, present here today and, and we have a few of them who will comment on, on the report and on the, the topic at hand today as well. But we, of course, very much like would like to welcome them here at SCI and, and thank them for, for supporting this research, which also from a very personal perspective, I found tremendously interesting. It's not only timely, but I think that there's really so some, a lot of, let's say, issues to be discussed and, and to be explored in, in much more detail. And hopefully what, what I'm presenting today will give you some teaser in, as to what, what we found in the report. Um, what I already mentioned, the report itself, there's one copy at the back, uh, but it's been launched uh, yesterday, so it's basically being printed in Copenhagen right now. Um, we also have a, a number of policy briefs in the back, which you can take. Um, so basically, uh, you, can, you can start reading right after the, the seminar. And then finally, I also want to, to reiterate what Jakob said, and, and to thank, uh, in this case, Hogan Seven from, from Cicero, who is here with us, but also someone who couldn't make it today, that's Peter Powell from the German Development Institute, and it's been a very pleasant collaboration with, 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 um, with these colleagues to get this report done uh, by today. So, before I, I, I go into some of the more technical details, I want to give a little bit of background why we're doing this report, what the topic of the report is. Um, then I want to highlight some of the key findings uh, and, and messages from the, from the report and, and basically open the, the room for, for discussion that, that we will have with the panel later. Um, there might be questions that you have about the report and about my presentation. Uh, we'll have, a, let's say, a quick uh, opportunity for, for, for questions right after this presentation. But I think most of the discussion would be useful to have this afternoon in a, in a broader group. So, as many of you will know, 2015 is, is a very important year for, for climate change. It's not only a very important year for climate change, it's also a very important year for addressing sustainable development more generally. But as, as most of you will know, is that by the end of this year, in December, there will be the 21st Conference of the Parties to the UNFCCC. So basically, one of the key climate change meetings to come up with a new agreement under the UNFCCC. An agreement that is applicable to all parties. So not only just developed country parties like the Kyoto Protocol. But of course, before we get to Paris, it's, it's useful to know a little bit of where we started from. And this is not even showing, let's say, the real start, let's say, from the 1990s onwards when the UNFCCC was negotiated. But basically, how, how the negotiations have evolved since 2011. So in 2011, parties launched the so-called ad hoc working group uh, on the Durban platform on enhanced action. And with that, they, they launched this, these negotiations on a 2015 agreement to come up with a universal climate change agreement that really... Uh, covers all the countries and to really get all the countries to take action on climate change mitigation and, ad and adaptation. But beyond these, these, these negotiations, or beyond the launch of the negotiations, there was still <coughs> quite, quite a bit of, uh, there were a lot of question marks around the specific architecture of, the, of the, the 2015 agreement. But in the last few years, more and more details have become known about this. And I think a key moment here was in 2013, when a new acronym was introduced in the climate change negotiations. And if anything, uh, the climate negotiators and the climate change community is very good at is introducing acronyms. And in this case, the, the, let's say the, the acronym du jour is the Intended Nationally Determined Contributions, or INDCs. Please remember this because I will refer to them quite a few times uh, in, the, in the next slides as well. Um, but basically, countries were asked, were invited to come forward with pledges to take climate action under a 2015 agreement. At the same time, there was not a tremendous amount of clarity about what these INDCs actually were, and I'll get to that in, in the next slide. But in, in Lima, in, in, in December 2014, so just a few months ago, parties at least agreed on a bit more information of what, what could possibly be included in under these INDCs. And I think by now, in, in February the first uh, INDC was submitted, and in March the second one followed, by now we start to get a bit of a better idea of what countries actually mean with, the, with this acronym. And the whole idea is that by December, 
there will be a range of, of, of these contributions, of these INDCs, that can then be included in the Paris Agreements. The question is though whether all, the, the, in the, all these INDCs of all the countries will be ready in time for Paris. Obviously, I'm not showing here that the, the error continues also well after Paris. <coughs> Paris is not the end point of international climate change action. Paris is a very important point. But at the same time, of course, Paris will not agree on all the details. Parties will, will still elaborate the details also in the coming months. So Paris, but Paris is, a, let's say, a crucial point for, for now, but it will not be the end point. So then, what are these, these, these INDCs? And a few months ago, this is, or especially, I would say, a year ago, there was a lot of discussion about what this could actually mean, whether it would include, uh, let's say, mitigation contributions, but also contributions in the context of adaptation. And now that the first ones have been submitted, there's at least a little bit more clarity. So the first INDC that was submitted, let's say, the, the, the best kid in class was uh, Switzerland in February which pledged to reduce its emissions of, uh, by 50% by 2030 and by 35% by 2025. The EU, uh, uh, a few weeks later, uh, also agreed on its own internal goal of, of reducing emissions by 40% by 2030, or at least 40%. Um, there's some other similarities between the two contributions. One is that both of the, 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 the scope of both these INDCs are economy-wide and also include land use, land use change and forestry, another one of these acronyms. Um, they use the same base year, um, although they differ in the use of international carbon credits, where the EU has clearly said, no, we will not use any carbon credits to achieve our targets. Switzerland has left that option open. But then these are just two, let's say the first two that have come in. What, what's going to happen when more of the, these INDs are going to come in? And I just want to highlight the, the two uh, likely INDCs, or the two likely contributions that's, that will come from the United States and China, two of the major powers in, in international politics, especially in the area of climate change. And what you see here is that the US has, has pledged to, to reduce its emissions of 26 to 28% by 2025, below 2005 levels. So maybe comparable in the sense that it's an absolute emission reduction target, but it uses a different base year. And then China has a different, different contribution altogether, which is focusing on, on peaking CO2 emissions rather than absolute emission reductions. And then there are other, other point is that it's about 20% of uh, energy supply needs to come from non-fossil fuel sources. So you can imagine that given the fact that there's no, let's say, complete streamlined idea of what these contributions will be, that the variety uh, between them theoretically is going to be quite large. Even though, as you can see with the EU and Switzerland, they can be quite similar. Then a related question there is that also adaptation might be included for, from, by, uh, for some of the INDCs. And we can particularly think of developing countries who say, well, the action that we've taken in, on adaptation is our contribution to tackling climate change. So this is what we're going to see in the, in the next few months. And it's not yet entirely clear what's, what the INDCs or all the different countries is going to look like. But what is becoming quite clear is that it's going to be difficult to see whether all these INDCs will come in, in time. And this is a graph made, made last month by the, the New Climate Institute which shows a bit of the progress made by the, in different countries on, on, on their, uh, developing their INDCs. And as you can see, like some have that already submitted and some are planning to submit in, in, in March already. But most of them are actually going to submit only in September, or at least most of the, 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 the countries they have surveyed. And for even some countries, they have no internal planning process at all at the moment. So the question is, well, when will these INDCs come in? Might it be just one or two months before Paris, or might it be earlier? At the moment, it's not completely clear for all countries yet. <coughs> so it's important to, to know this as a background. Uh, yes, we are going to look at, at contributions and how they're being reviewed, but it's, no, it's important to know what these contributions actually are and when they're coming in. <coughs> so why then is assessment and review? So basically the topic of, of our report, why is that important? <coughs> and here I think there's a number of reasons. So first of all, we argue also in the report that assessment and review can be crucial in, in identifying to see whether we are on track to meet our collectively agreed targets, but also to see whether the contributions made by different, different countries and different parties are actually fair. So the, the, both from a point of view of effectiveness as well as fairness, uh, the an assessment and review process can be of crucial importance. But then also assessment and review can help basically uncovering the information and the assumptions underlying these contributions. So it can also enhance the credibility of these contributions by increasing transparency. 
And finally, by sharing this information widely, not only among parties, but also among other stakeholders, with NGOs, with businesses, uh, with, with the research uh, organizations, it can basically enhance accountability, the accountability of, of the actions taken by parties. So overall, these aspects, effectiveness, fairness, credibility and transparency and accountability, in the end, they form the, the foundations for trust building, for really for international cooperation on climate change. <coughs> so that's, that's no mean feat, but in, in, uh, as was reformulated in the report, like, in a world that is increasingly moving towards a top-down system, the, the review forms, let's say, the last bastion of the, the, the top-down, uh, sorry, increasingly moving towards the bottom-up system, the, the review system forms, let's say, the last bastion of this top-down system. So that's why, at least, we think that the rationale for the report is, is, is justified. So, when we did the research, one of the, the first things that, that we encountered was, was that there was actually quite a high level of confusion of actually what is meant by assessment and review. And there were a lot of discussions at the time on, on well, there's on one hand ex ante review, and on the other hand there's an ex post review. And we tried to, to disentangle the, the, these aspects and the types of review that, that, that uh, parties but also observers have been talking about. So on the one hand, you can make the, the distinction between a review of individual contributions. So a review of a contribution by Switzerland, for example. And on the other hand, you can look at the review of parties collectively. So for example, do par what parties are pledging in aggregate, does that live up to globally agreed goals? But then, on a, at a similar, uh, or at a different level, you can also make a distinction in terms of the timing of the review. And when people talk about ex ante review, they are most of the time talking about, let's say, the top left corner, they're talking about review of contributions before they're somehow being anchored or inscribed in a 2015 agreement, or maybe in a future agreement, in a future contribution cycle. But at the same time, there are already ongoing processes of review that have been taking place since the very beginning of the UNFCCC. So there are ongoing processes of, of, of monitoring, reporting, and verification, and I will talk a bit about, about a few of them, um, which, which are more focused on how well are parties implementing their contributions. And then finally, there are processes which basically, uh, at, after the fact, or after, let's say, a certain commitment period has ended, look at, well, did a country or did a party comply with its, its commitments? And this is normally what is referred to as the ex post. Collectively, you can make a similar distinction. You could look at the collective uh, contributions uh, in advance, or you can look at it at a slightly later date or during the implementation. So in the report what we did is before we, we, we wanted to look at the options of uh, assessment and review under 2015 agreement, we really wanted to, to make sure that we covered well what is already out there. And any review processes under 2015 agreement is not going to start on a blank slate. So here are just uh, four of the, the processes that we covered. We covered three more, I think, in the, in the report. But each, each of them offers their own lessons. So when we talk about the, the review of national communications, which are submitted regularly by, by Annex 1 uh, and non-Annex 1 parties, you can see that already uh, in these com national communications, in their review, emissions trends and emissions policies are already being reviewed. But also, one of the lessons from this process is that the high frequency of review can be quite resource intensive. And this is something to keep in mind, especially if we try to include more countries. Similarly, with the technical review of, of several reports under the Kyoto Protocol, um, there's a few lessons that, that can be learned there. Here, one of the main lessons is that the expert review process uh, as such, basically having a group of experts reviewing a report from a country can actually help, help that country in realizing, well, this is the way, th this is how we can really get, come into compliance at a later stage. But also here, one of the, the, the lessons is that reviews actually require quite a large pool of experts and quite a significant resources. Then from more recent uh, review processes, and again, I, I have two new acronyms, and this is IAR, which is International Assessment and Review, and ICA, which stands for International Consultations and Analysis, with IAR being applicable to developed country parties and ICA applicable to developing country. Um, also here, what, what, there's a few lessons. One is that they, these processes actually show that there's some level of streamlining that is possible between all these different review processes. What they also show that it's actually possible to combine expert reviews and more multilateral party-to-party -party reviews. And finally, they show that it's actually possible to treat some countries differently, 
because in this case, the, the least developed countries and the small island states are being tr treated differently under these processes. And finally, another example for, from the current process is that, is that already uh, there's experience with aggregate level reviews. At the moment, there's an ongoing review uh, which is trying to see uh, whether the two degrees target is actually adequate for parties and whether it's maybe necessary to move towards a one and a half degree target. So as you can see, there are a number of lessons uh, to be learned, but also a number of systems that can be built on in the future. Then the other thing which was already mentioned by, by Jacob is that we also looked at a number of processes outside of the UNFCCC. Not because you can take these as analogies and say whatever happened in the World Trade Organization can also happen in the UNFCCC, but just to get some lessons and get some ideas from these processes. And here, one of the things that we figured out with the trade policy review mechanism under the WTO is that actually it's interestingly possible to link the frequency of the review to a share of world trade, so to specific criteria. So that might bring the idea, is it possible to link a future review to a share of global emissions, for example? But it also shows that group reviews are possible, <coughs> so a number of countries being reviewed at the same time. Another interesting process uh, that we think is, is the, the Universal Periodic Review, which is the human rights review system. And I think here one of the, the most interesting aspects is that even for a sens sensitive and, a, let's say, a topic that, that really touches on, upon national sovereignty as, as much as one can imagine, it's possible to actually involve non-governmental stakeholders in these processes. And then again, it might, might form a hopeful lesson for the climate regime. Another aspect that they do is that they, the subsequent reviews, so future reviews, actually build on how well the outcomes of a previous re ha review have been implemented. Uh, what th this process shows is that funding is possible to help countries participate and implement recommendations. And what this process shows is that actually it can be quite difficult if countries really do not want to cooperate. So if, you're, if a country is being reviewed and the re recommendation is coming out of a review, <coughs> then the country says, well, nice that you give us these recommendations, but we're going to ignore them. What do you do then? What you do then is look at the Montreal Protocol, where there is actually a stick. So if, if there is non-cooperation under, under the Montreal Protocol on ozone depleting substances, <coughs> it might actually be possible to take trade measures, for example, against the country. So what you see here is that there, there's a possible stick to really make sure that countries live up and, and, and really cooperate with the review. But another lesson that the Montreal Protocol offers us is that there's a link between the outcome of a review and the re, uh, receiving financial and other support. So as I said, there's quite a number of, of ideas that, that come out of these processes and that could be helpful also in, in the coming year in thinking about designing and organizing a process under the UNFCCC. So we structured the report along a number of questions, with the first of these questions being, what exactly should be reviewed? And I already mentioned that the INDCs themselves, their substance can be quite different for different parties. So maybe up till now it's all mainly about mitigation, so how many emission reductions our country is going to commit to. But it might be that some countries also will include adaptation related information. And maybe other countries will include financial or technological information. So basically to say, well, our financial needs are this and this much and we want, uh, we want to receive that. Or a country may say, well, our financial contribution is going to be X dollars. And maybe this, this will happen in the coming year. At the moment, it's still unclear. There's no specific mandates in, in, the, in, the, in the most recent decision. But at the same time, some countries have indicated that they want this type of information in their contributions. The question here is, is that uh, what information should be reviewed? And it's here it's important to know that already these existing review processes that I mentioned, they already focus, almost all of them focus uh, ex exclusively on, on mitigation. But it's also interesting to see that some of them also focus on means of implementation. So finance, technology transfer, and capacity building. So for example, the international assessment and review that I just mentioned is one of these processes which not only looks at mitigation, but also at, at the financial contributions of parties. Then. It's important to keep in mind when, when, when thinking about, well, what kind of information should be reviewed, <coughs> it's important to note that, and I think Hawken can probably mention this in, in more detail, um, is that means, the review of, of means of implementation and a review <coughs> specifically of financial contribution has been a key priority for at least some developing countries. And I'm thinking particularly uh, of, of countries like China and India who have been, been really hammering that this is an important aspect for them. But then, Reviewing more information is not necessarily easy to do. It may require more resources, it may require more expertise. 
Also, is it really useful to have just loads and loads of information to be reviewed? It might also just confuse uh, the stakeholders. So it's, it's not an easy, easy thing to say whether it's, it's the review should be extended also to other types of information, but from a political point of view, it might be necessary. Then another question, again, a very contested question, is should there be differentiation between different types of parties in these processes? And here, um, it's important to, to distinguish between, on one hand, the type of differentiation, and on the other hand, the, the way that can be differentiated. So, in terms of the type of differentiation, you can differentiate maybe between different contributions. So you will have a different review process for an absolute emission reduction target versus a process for maybe voluntary energy efficiency targets. But it can also be done by, by parties or by groups of parties. So there might be a different review processes for the least developed countries versus other developing countries, for example. But then in terms of the means, uh, there's actually a very long list also in the report. And my uh, view is that the, the way that can be differentiated, there's a lot of creativity and there's a lot of possibilities to do so. So here I just listed a few of these options. It might be that you give some countries access to funding and others not. It might be that for some countries group reviews are possible, for others it isn't. It might be that the frequency for some countries is higher than others. Or it might be that the outcomes of the review processes might be requirements for one country and let's say soft recommendations for others. So there's a lot of uh, aspects there and a lot of flexibility to play around with, with, these, with, uh, with differentiation. When we're looking at the, like, what was, how to move forward, I think it's important to know that differentiation can be done for both reasons of, of fairness and equity. So it might be necessary to treat countries differently because their circumstances are differently, for example, because they're poorer, but also for reasons of pragmatism. I already mentioned that, that the number of experts and the number of re resources, or the amount of resources is quite limited. So maybe we simply cannot have a review in as much depth for each country. But at the same time, what you, what you end up with is a trade-off between, on the one hand, the, the transparency. So ideally, you would show as much as possible for all these countries versus the administrative efficiency, so the cost of these reviews. So this is a difficult trade-off that needs to be made. Then a the third question we looked at is, well, which kind of criteria do we actually use uh, in, in these reviews? So against which benchmark uh, are we judging countries? And then on the one hand, you have, let's say, uh, criteria which are more of substantive nature, so ambition and adequacy, so basically are countries doing enough? And, and on, the, uh, on the other hand you have fairness and equity, so is what countries are doing actually fair? And you have more, what we term more procedural criteria, so is what countries doing transparent? Is it accurate? Have countries reported on time? Uh, is it consistent with, with the, the reporting format? Which, is a, a, which are more of a procedural nature, and interestingly, these criteria are already used in quite a lot of the review processes that I mentioned. So it's clearly feasible to, to agree on some of these criteria, but it might be difficult to extend them in the, uh, in the future review process. But what can definitely be said is that agreement on criteria, as, as desirable as they are, but agreement on criteria related to ambition and, and equity and fairness might be more difficult to achieve in Paris. Then, the fourth question we looked at is the timing. So when should, should assessment and review uh, be carried out? And here we made a distinction between the types of review processes that, that I showed in the beginning. So when it comes to the, this ex-ante review, so basically a review, in this case, before Paris, uh, but also maybe in future contribution cycles, it could possibly be done on a rolling basis. So whenever new contributions come in, they are being reviewed. It can be done after a submission of a certain number of these contributions. So maybe if 50 parties have submitted their contributions, then the review starts. Or it could be done periodically, so every five years there will be a new review uh, of these contributions that are available at that time. <coughs> when it comes to the review of implementation, so basically how are countries doing in implementing the contributions, here the question is rather what do we do with the current monitoring, uh, reporting and verification systems? Do we stick with them? Do we amend them? Do we adjust them? Or do we start with a whole new process? Again, these are not easy questions to, to, to answer, but these are some of the options. When it comes to the, the, the review of compliance, uh, the question here is primarily what's, what happens with compliance in any case, and that's a much bigger question that we can probably address uh, in these uh, two hours. <coughs> but one could, on one hand, say that, that it could happen after, every five years, or it can, it can again happen on a continuous basis. And then finally, the aggregate assessment, so all parties together. 
here I think the, the, the suggestion that we have is that this can be done in line with existing processes. So already uh, this is, there is a process in place that, that can uh, allow for aggregate assessments on a regular basis. Then moving on to the, the fifth question, which is about how do we actually organize these processes? And again, a lot of ideas can, can be, be drawn from existing review processes, both under and outside of the UNFCCC. Um, I will not, not go through this slide in detail, and I will let you read the, the policy brief uh, and order report for that. But I think the most important point of this slide is that there are a lot of options here that can, that can be done. But a few months ago, when parties gathered in Lima, they basically, for the process before Paris, they discarded pretty much all of these options, except for maybe uh, a compilation by the UNFCCC Secretariat of the contributions that have been submitted by uh, October 2015. So, the reason why I'm <coughs> saying that is that it actually highlights what, what, is, what is listed down here. It highlights the importance of actually assessments outside of the UNFCCC process. And when I say outside of the UNFCCC process, I mean assessments that are carried out in an informal, so let's say, party-to-party -party basis, or assessments that are carried out by observers. And this is happening. So, uh, organizations like ECOFIS, World Resources Institute, UNEP, they, are ongoing, um, they have ongoing assessments of the new contributions as soon as they come in. But also parties are, are having these discussions. And there might be discussions on a less, less formal basis in Bonn in June to basically discuss each other's uh, contributions to, to enhance understanding. That doesn't mean that these contributions will actually change, but at least there will be some kind of discussion about what's happening, and some kind of consultations. Then finally, and again I will go, go through this slightly quickly because I think this will also be more discussed in, in the panel. Uh, we looked at uh, the way how as assessment and review plays a role in ratcheting up ambition over time. And we made a distinction here because there's been a lot of talk about ratcheting mechanisms. So basically making sure that the ambitions of parties are increased over time. And we made the distinction on the one hand uh, that ratcheting mechanisms that are clearly related to the review process as such, as such and other uh, ratcheting mechanisms which are not necessarily related to the assessment and the review process, but are related to the broader architecture of the 2015 agreement. So clearly agreeing on a long-term goal, let's say a slightly more specific goal than a two degrees target, clearly that is going to be important for ratcheting up ambition because it gives let's say parties a destination towards to go to. Uh, but this is not necessarily a feature of the assessment and review process. Similarly, a regular negotiating cycle, making sure that countries, let's say every few years, get together and have a discussion about uh, how they're increasing their ambition. Very important for ratcheting up, but not necessarily part of the assessment and review process. Again, um, contribution for us, basically making sure that whatever parties are doing, and this is also sometimes referred to as not backsliding, but it basically means that whatever parts are doing, next time they're going to do more. It's another important aspect of the 2015 agreement, but not necessarily really, uh, part of the, the assessment and review process. So what is part of the assessment and review process that could help with ratcheting up is, and here we have just two suggestions, there are more suggestions in the report, is a recommendation for upward adjustments. So whatever comes out of the review process, the, the recommendation or possibly even a requirement, to go uh, to move ambition upwards could be help, could help with ratcheting up ambition. Similarly, to have a periodic review of the adequacy of what countries are doing together might help with, with uh, ratcheting up ambition over time. Speaking of time, I'm probably going slightly over mine, but I'll wrap up. Um, so some of the key messages from from the from from the report, and again, uh, you, you can read the report in, in more detail and, and also for more justification for some of these messages. And I'm happy to discuss it with you uh, now and, and in the panel discussion as well. So the first one should perhaps be the most obvious, and that is that assessment and review is essential for trust building, for international cooperation broadly, and in the end, we think that it can help enhance ambition and, and increase fairness as well. <coughs> then with respect to the, 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 the type of contribution that it should cover, we believe that it should definitely cover mitigation uh, contributions, but that a review process is also covering means of implementation, so again, finance, technology, capacity building, might help with forging a consensus in Paris. Then we, su we suggest that this assessment and review should cover all parties, 
but at the same time that differentiation can be both fair and practical. And again, there's a lot of suggestions that we make in the report that could be implemented in practice. Uh, the question is, of course, what, what will work best. Then, finally, we, we, and this is a, is, a, is a more difficult suggestion to make, because on the one hand, we see the need for an increased role, or let's say at least a clarified role of non-state actors in the review processes, in a similar way that it's happening with the human rights regime. <coughs> but at the same time, there's still some resistance from some parties to have observers, to have non-state actors involved in these processes. But we would suggest that especially if there is no formal process, like what's happening now in, in, up to, in the lead up to Paris, especially in those cases, I think the role of non-state actors is going to be crucial. Then finally, we're obviously raising a lot of uh, options. We're, we're, we're discussing a lot of, we're covering a lot of ground in the report. Um, but I think one of the key messages is not all of the things that we, we're suggesting in the report, not all of the, the questions that we've raised in the report need addressing before Paris. And this is going back to one of the first slides, uh, the arrow continues. So basically, yes, it's going to be important to have some basic agreement on, for example, that we have an assessment and a review process, that we ideally clarify the scope of such a review, that we get, decide on the basic criteria of the review, if we are going to use any, what types of differentiation, give an indication of the timing, and maybe an indication of the role of non-state actors, but all the details, modalities and, and procedures do not have to be agreed necessarily in Paris. They can also be agreed, let's say, between 2016 and 2020. So this is an important uh, caveat and, and a reminder that we're dealing with a very complex topic. And of course, this is only one part of the Paris Agreement and there will be other aspects that will be equally, if not more important uh, to deal with. And I think I will leave it at that, but thanks so much for coming. Thank you.